The early days of Sega's console business in Japan is loaded with interesting details. When Sega launched the SG-1000 in 1983, they had a pretty clear-cut idea of what they wanted to do. Unlike Nintendo, Sega wanted a console they made the majority of games for. If you look at the library of the SG-1000, the vast majority of those games were developed and or published by Sega themselves. Even when there was a port from another platform like the arcade, it was typically Sega that reprogrammed it. What a lot of folks don't realize is, is that this trend continued in Japan with the Sega Mark III, and eventually its rebranding as the Sega Master System. Sega continued to be the dominant maker of games even then. Some assume this was only because of Nintendo's draconian, third-party licensing deals at the time. But it was also a case where Sega had no real desire to allow competitors to make games for its consoles. In fact, Sega had no real third-party programs in place in the mid-1980s. Sega didn't really start branching out in this area until the late 80s as the Master System was being replaced by the Genesis. That means the Japanese Mark III had few games that did not make their way west. There were a few text-heavy adventure titles, and then there were those we are about to take a look at. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the Sega Mark III releases that were only available in Japan or the broader Asian region. I hope you guys enjoy Japanese-only Master System games. To this day, I am shocked that Megumi Rescue was not released in the US or Europe for the Master System. Originally released in 1988, this is actually a cool title with some fun and challenging gameplay. You are part of a fire rescue team that must battle blazes while rescuing people and their pets. Your team uses a trampoline-like device to launch your firefighter up to the floors of the burning building, where you have the option of grabbing the windows to put out fires, find bonus items, or rescue people. As the fire consumes more and more of the building, you must move faster to save everyone. If the fire reaches the people before you do, they drop from the windows and must be caught to be saved. Stages get more complicated the deeper you get in, and fires begin to spread differently to challenge you even more. This one uses the paddle controller to move your team left and right and took advantage of the FM sound unit for increased audio quality. It's actually quite playable if you have the means, and one of the better paddle controller games available. It's based on an unreleased arcade version that was eventually made for the Famicom called Flying Hero. This is a winner, and well worth playing. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but 1987's Alex Kidd BMX Trial is another one that uses the paddle controller and was Japanese exclusive. Unlike our last game, however, this one is about as fun as a swift kick in the testicular region. The graphics are colorful but super simple and the gameplay is utterly forgettable. Your goal is to survive obstacles on your BMX and water bikes. Those obstacles are everywhere, however, and I've never seen more than three different stages to this game. It gets so frustrating so fast, all I want to do is turn it off after a minute of gameplay. There are power-ups to help if you get good enough to find them, but there is no question why Sega held this title back from an international release. It just straight up sucks. I was really happy to see 1988 Solomon Key make its way to the Master System courtesy of Tecmo. This was based on their classic arcade title where you must avoid monsters, grab the key, and get to the exit. You have the power to create and break blocks so you can effectively navigate the play area. Plus you can collect other power-ups like fireballs to help you eliminate enemies. This is another excellent game that I really wish Sega had picked up for a western release. It's quite faithful to the source, and looks and sounds really nice. 
I tended to not care for the puzzle genre unless it had a solid action mechanic to the gameplay, and Solomon's Key fills that requirement nicely. It even uses the FM sound module as a bonus. If you track this one down in its original form, you'll notice it comes in a special silver cartridge box that has Celio on it. This was actually a fake company that Tecmo used to get around Nintendo's contracts. It's a Japanese exclusive that you should definitely check out. Also in 1988, Tecmo released a port of their arcade classic Rygar for the Japanese Master System. And just like Solomon's Key, this has FM sound support, comes in the silver cartridge box, and uses a fake company as the publisher. It also happens to be a heck of a good action game. Its challenge is unrelenting, and you'll need to put in some serious time to get good. Most of what is here is platforming and an endless assault of air and ground based enemies. You can attack left and right, straight up, as well as during your jump. Power-ups can extend your attack range and it has a fair bit of content from the arcade. That means it's radically different from the NES version, but still has a charm all its own. It repeats assets a little too often, and the late game can be repetitive, but I still recommend you give it a shot, particularly if you enjoyed the arcade. I would have rather have had a port of the NES version, but since Nintendo made that pretty much impossible, this was still nice to see. I think with a slight adjustment to the spawn rate of the enemies, this one would have done quite well in the United States and Europe. In 1987, Sega released yet another paddle controller game called Woody Pop, which was sort of a breakout style game where you must protect your balls from falling into a pit as they destroy blocks. These games were fairly popular in the 1980s, and there are numerous variations of the idea. In this one, you can get power-ups that break the blocks easier, as well as multiple balls at the same time. Not much to say here as the premise is super simple and most of you have played some form of it a hundred times. While Sega did leave this in Japan for the Master System, four years later they moved it over to the Game Gear, where it of course relied on digital controls. It was the very last of the My Card game releases for the Master System in Japan as well. If you have a paddle controller, give it a go. Otherwise, stick with the Game Gear if you're curious. Speaking of my card game, Sega released Satellite 7 for the Mark III in 1985. This is an extremely simple shoot 'em up where you blast endless waves of enemies with little in the way of help from power ups. This one grows tiresome fast with similar enemies and terrain dominating the experience. The genre was still young at this point, and other games of the era suffered the same repetition. At this point, it's more curiosity at best and won't hold your attention for very long. Sega definitely made the right call leaving this one in Japan. The Master System had some fantastic shoot 'em ups, and this didn't hold up at all in comparison. Opa Opa was a pretty popular little guy in Japan. He even served as Sega's mascot there for a while. So it was no surprise that in 1988, he got another game all his own. Galactic Protector is a huge departure from Fantasy Zone, though still technically a shoot 'em up. This time you are guarding planets from damage by shooting enemies and other dangers before they reach you. You can only move in a circular path around the planet you are protecting. 
It requires the use of the paddle controller and supports FM sound, but honestly, I can't stand this game for more than a few minutes. It gets really difficult and by the second planet, I am done having my ass kicked. It was an obvious attempt to get something out using Opa Opa to help sell the paddle controller, but the stunning lack of depth here for a game released in 1988 renders it completely forgettable. By this point, we had games like Salamander, Gradius, and R-Type at home, leaving this relic impressing no one. Okay, so most of you remember the Master System version of Great Golf here. It was released in the US and Europe in 1987, supported FM sound, and wasn't half bad. What a lot of people don't know is, is that a year earlier, Japan got a completely different version of Great Golf. Instead of the third-person, forward-scrolling viewpoint of the 1987 international release, this one here was played from an isometric view with completely different graphics, gameplay, and music. It didn't support FM sound and was much harder to boot. It's not a bad game, but man do I suck at it. Nearly every hole I get a double bogey, no matter how well my initial drive turns out. The clubs seem to hit the ball different distances every damn time. These kinds of games hold up well though, so if you are a fan, I really do recommend you give it a try. It's no Neo Turf Masters, but it can be a good one to spend an afternoon with. For those curious, the International Great Golf was released in Japan as well, but came under the title Masters Golf instead. Great Baseball had a very similar situation to Great Golf. Most of you likely remember this game here, the international version of Great Baseball. It was released in all the major regions outside of Japan in 1987. Thing is, way back in 1985, Sega released a MyCard game called, you guessed it, Great Baseball exclusively in Japan. This is a completely different title that was nothing like the international release. It's a much slower game that mainly consists of foul balls and infield pop-ups. Scoring a run is damn near impossible. It doesn't play terrible, it's just that everything ends in a quick out. I've never seen a home run occur and it's terribly slow at times. Japan did see an eventual release of the international version of Great Baseball, but it came under the name the Pro Baseball Pennant Race. It was actually an upgraded version of Great Baseball and plays much faster and spits out home runs like they're nothing. That means there are basically three versions of Great Baseball on the Master System. I guess if you don't get it right the first time, keep trying until you do. I wanted to do this episode for a few different reasons. The first was to show you how little support the Master System received in Japan. With virtually no third-party developers, it was left up to Sega by themselves to do all the heavy lifting. The vast majority of the Master System library left Japan because Sega was in terrible need of games for it in other regions. Once the platform took off in Europe and Brazil, Sega had a full stable of third parties helping bring many more titles out. I also wanted to highlight Megumi Rescue, Solomon's Key, and Rygar. Since they weren't released in North America or Europe, they likely haven't been played by the majority of you. Sega's strategy with the Master System was all over the map, literally. But the platform's overall failure to sell in the US and Japan comes almost exclusively from the lack of games the platform suffered. 
While Nintendo was building a massive list of third parties to support their hardware, all of Sega's time and effort went into making games, trying to maximize profits with their own IPs. This created a huge imbalance that left the Master System with a fraction of the choice of its competitors. Once Nintendo was entrenched in the market, their monopoly made it almost impossible for Sega to do anything to counter it, something that affected them well into the life of the Genesis. The Master System is a fine console, but it would have been so much better with the third-party support Nintendo cultivated. I still wonder what a Contra or Metal Gear would have looked like on the old Master System, complete with FM support and all that beautiful color it could put out. I hope the Sega fans of a parallel universe got to experience it. I'm Sega Lord X. thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.